In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let us kneel. Prayer to our Lord on the cross for a happy hour of death. O my crucified Jesus, mercifully accept the prayer which I now make to thee for help in the moment of my death. When at its approach, all my senses shall fail me. When therefore, O sweetest Jesus, my weary and downcast eyes can no longer look up to thee, be mindful of the loving gaze which now I turn on thee and have mercy on me. When my parched lips can no longer kiss thy most sacred wounds, remember then those kisses which I now imprint on thee and have mercy on me. When my cold hands can no longer embrace thy cross, Forget not the affection with which I embrace it now, and have mercy on me. And when at length my swollen and lifeless tongue can no longer speak, remember that I called upon thee now. Jesus, Mary, Joseph, to thee do I commend my soul. Amen. You may be seated. It's very clear in the readings for today, the first Sunday of Lent, both in the epistle from 2 Corinthians, the tract, and also the gospel, that in Lent, there's truly that greater intensity in the spiritual battle. The battle between good and evil, the battle between heaven and hell, the battle between the Holy Ghost and Satan, the battle between truly purifying our lives, our hearts, our bodies, and being led astray by our disordered passions. Once again, this Sunday, this first Sunday of Lent, I urge you to remember the importance of our mortality, that every single one of us is going to face death. The more we contemplate our own mortality and what is going to take place at the moment of death in terms of the judgment and then two possible eternal destinies, either salvation or damnation, then the more we're going to see and sense the importance of really engaging in the battle and really being faithful to prayer, to fasting, to almsgiving. We're going to realize more and more this is the very stuff of our life. This morning, I'm basically just going to read to you from a very famous sermon that was given by St. Leonard of Port Morris. Because what he's doing is he's teaching about death and what's going to take place, we might say, after death. He's teaching about salvation. Again, many, many Catholics are not basing their life on the truths of the faith. And it's very important that when we contemplate death during the season of Lent, that we're also well aware that pretty much our Catholic tradition is telling us that those that are going to be saved are few in number. Repeat that. Those that are going to be saved are few in number. St. Leonard of Port Morris was a most holy Franciscan friar who lived at the monastery of St. Bonaventure in Rome. He lived in the years 1676 to 1751. He was one of the greatest missionaries in the history of the church. He preached to thousands in the open square of every city and town where the churches could not hold his listeners. So brilliant and holy was his eloquence that once when he gave a two weeks' mission in Rome, the Pope and the College of Cardinals came to hear him. The Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, and the Veneration of the Sacred Heart of Jesus were his crusades. One of St. Leonard of Port Maurice's most famous sermons was titled, The Little Number of Those Who Are Saved. It was one he relied on for the conversion of great sinners. I'm going to now read some from that sermon. Obviously, I'm not going to read it all, but again, what I'm about to begin reading are his words. They're not my words. They're the words of St. Leonard, a great, as we just heard, one of the greatest missionaries in the history of the church. They're his words. He's also going to be quoting a lot of the great saints. And so we'll listen now. These are his words. It begins. 
The point of this instruction is to decide whether the number of Christians who are saved is greater or less than the number of Christians who are damned. It will, I hope, produce in you a salutary fear of the judgment of God. Brothers, because of the love I have for you, I wish I could reassure you with the prospect of eternal happiness by saying to each of you, you are certain to go to paradise. The greater number of Christians are saved, so you also will be saved. But how can I give you this sweet assurance if you revolt against God's decrees as though you are your own worst enemies? I observe in God a sincere desire to save you, but I find in you a decided inclination to be damned. Let us listen to two learned cardinals, Cachetan and Bellarmine. They teach that the greater number of Christian adults are damned. Add the authority of the Greek and Latin fathers to that of the theologians, and you will find almost all of them saying the same thing. This is the sentiment of St. Theodore, St. Basil, St. Ephraim, and St. John Chrysostom. You will hear St. Gregory saying clearly, Many attain to faith, but few to the heavenly kingdom. St. Anselm declares, Those are few who are saved. St. Augustine states even more clearly, Therefore, few are saved in comparison to those who are damned. The most terrifying, however, is St. Jerome. At the end of his life, in the presence of his disciples, he spoke these dreadful words. Out of 100,000 people whose lives have always been bad, you will barely find one who is worthy of indulgence. But why seek out the opinions of the fathers and theologians when Holy Scripture settles the question so clearly? Look to the Old and New Testaments, and you will find a multitude of figures, symbols, and words that clearly point out this truth. Very few are saved. In the time of Noah, the entire human race was submerged by the deluge, and only eight people were saved in the ark. St. Peter says, this ark was the figure of the church, while St. Augustine adds, and these eight people who were saved signify that very few Christians are saved because there are very few who sincerely renounce the world and those who renounce it only in words do not belong to the mystery represented by that ark. And then St. Leonard of Port Maurice, what he does is he quotes our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, two very important phrases by our Lord, strive to enter by the narrow gate, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. And many are called, but few are chosen. Then he continues, again, words of St. Leonard. Yet I am horror struck when I hear St. Jerome declaring that although the world is full of priests, barely one in a hundred is living in a manner in conformity with his state. When I hear a servant of God, again namely Jerome, attesting that he has learned by revelation that the number of priests who fall into hell each day is so great that it seemed impossible to him that there be any left on earth, I am horror struck. When I hear St. Chrysostom exclaiming with tears in his eyes, I do not believe that many priests are saved. I believe the contrary, that the number of those who are damned is greater. Look higher still and see the prelates of the Holy Church, pastors who have the charge of souls. Is the number of those who are saved among them greater than the number of those who are damned? Woe to you who command others. If so many are damned by your fault, what will happen to you? If few out of those who are first in the church of God are saved, what will happen to you? Take all states, both sexes, every condition, husbands, wives, widows, young women, young men, soldiers, merchants, craftsmen, rich and poor, noble and plebeian. What are we to say about all these people who are living so badly? The following narrative from St. Vincent Ferrer will show you what you may think about it. He relates that an archdeacon in Lyon, France, gave up his charge and retreated into a desert place to do penance, and that he died the same day and hour as St. Bernard. After his death, he appeared to his bishop and said to him, No, Monsignor, 
that at the very hour I passed away, 33,000 people also died. Out of this number, Bernard and myself went up to heaven without delay. Three went to purgatory, and all the others fell into hell. Our chronicles relate an even more dreadful happening. One of our brothers, well known for his doctrine and holiness, was preaching in Germany. He represented the ugliness of the sin of impurity, so forceful that a woman fell dead of sorrow in front of everyone. Then coming back to life, she said, When I was presented before the tribunal of God, 60,000 people arrived at the same time from all parts of the world. And out of that number, three were saved by going to purgatory, and all the rest were damned. O abyss of the judgments of God! Out of 30,000, only five were saved, and out of 60,000, only three went to heaven. You sinners who are listening to me, in what category will you be numbered? What do you say? What do you think? Here I'll take a brief parenthesis from his sermon. These are the things that we should be thinking about during the season of Lent. Notice in something that he relates, a true story. Notice how it's linked very clearly to the truths that the church teaches about death. At the moment of death, you will appear before the tribunal of God. And that's exactly what happens with this woman who appears before the tribunal of God and then she says that there's 60,000 other people that from around the world also appeared or were at the tribunal of God before that moment. And as St. Leonard asks us, in what category will you be numbered? What do you say? What do you think? This is why the church gives us Lent. So that we can contemplate our death, the ashes, the skull. But so that we can contemplate it in the light of the truth. And so that we will realize what the stakes are. The stakes are eternal. And so that we will not be misled by thinking falsely, Oh well, God loves us. Everyone goes to heaven. Completely false. One of the beautiful things about the Sermon of St. Leonard is in the second part, and that's what I'll conclude with. I'll just take a few excerpts from the second part. The second part of his sermon, he speaks exactly about the goodness of God in beautiful ways. He's teaching the faithful about how good God is and how great God is, but he's teaching the faithful about the goodness of God, faithful to the Catholic Church. And don't forget this. The vast majority of people today, when they speak about the love of God or the goodness of God, basically, they don't know what they're talking about. And they are being led astray, even by the evil one. Anyone who speaks of the goodness of God in ways not similar to St. Leonard of Port Maurice is not transmitting faithfully Catholic teaching about the goodness of God. And now, listen closely, because it's very beautiful how this great saint preaches about the goodness of God. But at the same time, one realizes how serious the decisions are that we make on a daily basis. And this is what he writes. Let us take these two undeniable truths as a basis. God wants all men to be saved. Two. All are in need of the grace of God. Remember those. God wants all men to be saved. All are in need of the grace of God. Now he continues. Now, if I show you that God wants to save all men and that for this purpose he gives all of them his grace and all the other necessary means of obtaining that sublime end, you will be obliged to agree that whoever is damned must impute it to his own malice and that if the greater number of Christians are damned, it is because they want to be. Thy damnation comes from thee. In a hundred places in Holy Scripture, God tells us that it is truly His desire to save all men. Is it my will that a sinner should die, and not that he should be converted from his ways and live? I live, saith the Lord God, I desire not the death of the sinner. Be converted and live. God is so good that when He sees a sinner running to his ruin, He runs after him, calls him, and treats him and accompanies him even to the gates of hell. What will he not do to convert him? He sends him good inspirations and holy thoughts. And if the sinner does not profit from them, God becomes angry and indignant. God pursues him. Will God strike him? No. God beats at the air and forgives him. 
But the sinner is not converted yet. God sends him a mortal illness. It is certainly all over for the sinner. No, brothers. God heals him. The sinner becomes obstinate in evil. And God in his mercy looks for another way. He gives him another year. And when that year is over, he grants him yet another. Here, I'm going to make my own parentheses. That's what's going on right now. Reread and study the epistle for today. That's why St. Paul, the great apostle, is saying, now is the time of salvation. Because right now, God is giving you another Lent. Right now, God is giving you another opportunity to convert and turn away from sin and live. St. Leonard continues. And when that year is over, he grants him yet another. But if the sinner still wants to cast himself into hell in spite of all that, what does God do? Does he abandon him? No. He takes him by the hand. And while he has one foot in hell and the other outside, he still preaches to him. He implores him not to abuse his graces. Now I ask you, if that man is damned, is it not true that he is damned against the will of God and because he wants to be damned? Well, here, here at the, close to the very end, words of St. Leonard of Port Maurice to the sinner who is living in mortal sin. The sinner who is living in mortal sin. These are the words of the great saint. I am speaking to you who live in the habit of mortal sin, in hatred, in the mire of the vice of impurity, and who are getting closer to hell each day. Stop and turn around. It is Jesus who calls you, and who with his wounds, as with so many eloquent voices, cries to you, My son, if you are damned, you have only yourself to blame. Thy damnation comes from thee. Lift up your eyes and see all the graces with which I have enriched you to ensure your eternal salvation. I could have had you born in a forest in Barbary. That is what I did to many others. But I had you born in the Catholic faith. I had you raised by such a good father and such an excellent mother with the purest instructions and teachings. If you are damned in spite of that, whose fault will it be? Your own. My son, your own. Thy damnation comes from thee. I could have cast you into hell after the first mortal sin you committed without waiting for the second. I did it to so many others, but I was patient with you. I waited for you for many long years. I am still waiting for you today in penance. Again, parentheses, that's what Holy Mother Church is telling you today. I am still waiting for you today in penance. St. Leonard continues. If you are damned in spite of all that, whose fault is it? Your own, my son, your own. Thy damnation comes from thee. You know how many have died before your very eyes and were damned? That was a warning for you. You know how many others I set back on the right path to give you the good example? Do you remember what that excellent confessor told you? I am the one who had him say it. Did he not enjoin you to change your life and to make a good confession? I am the one who inspired him. Remember that sermon that touched your heart? I am the one who led you there. And what has happened between you and me in the secret of your heart? That you can never forget. Those interior inspirations, that clear knowledge, that constant remorse of conscience. Would you dare to deny them? All of these were so many aids of my grace because I wanted to save you. I refused to give them to many others and I gave them to you because I love you tenderly. My son, my son, if I spoke to them as tenderly as I am speaking to you today, how many other souls return to the right path? And you, you turn your back on me. Listen to what I'm going to tell you, for these are my last words. You have cost me my blood. If you want to be damned in spite of the blood I shed for you, do not blame me. You have only yourself to accuse and throughout all eternity. Do not forget that if you are damned in spite of me, you are damned because you want to be damned. Thy damnation comes from thee. Finally, and this is what we want to take to heart during the season of Lent and know that this is what we're supposed to be doing during Lent. 
This is why we contemplate our death in the light of the truth that the Catholic Church teaches. This is the final words of St. Leonard to the faithful, and they truly are words of great hope. I mean, they give us great hope. We're seeing the reality, but we see also the great hope that we have as Catholics. And he tells us, St. Leonard of Port Maurice, the following. Cast yourself at the feet of Jesus Christ and say to him, with tearful eyes and contrite heart, Lord, I confess that up until now I have not lived as a Christian. I am not worthy to be numbered among your elect. I recognize that I deserve to be damned. But your mercy is great and full of confidence in your grace. I say to you that I want to save my soul. Even if I have to sacrifice my fortune, my honor, my very life, as long as I am saved. If I have been unfaithful up to now, I repent, I deplore, I detest my infidelity. I ask you humbly to forgive me for it. Forgive me, good Jesus, and strengthen me also that I may be saved. I ask you not for wealth, honor, or prosperity. I ask you for one thing only, to save my soul. And remember, you don't know the day or the hour when you are going to die. You don't know if you're going to get a chance to pray this prayer to our Lord Jesus Christ. You better pray it now. Because again, you know not the day or the hour. I ask you, Lord, not for wealth, honor, or prosperity. I ask you for one thing only, to save my soul. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.